Okay. I think we are on. Hello, I'm Emily Joya, Online Program Manager at the Edible Schoolyard Project. We are thrilled to be hanging out with Harold McGee, a world-renowned authority and award-winning author on the science and chemistry of foods and cooking. Harold has written two prize-winning books on food and cooking and The Curious Book, and has authored a food column on science and cooking for the New York Times for five years. Harold lectures widely on flavor and has participated in studies and initiatives worldwide in the pursuit of better understanding uh, the science of taste. On election night, uh, that was about a month ago, we were fortunate to have Harold lecture at the UC Berkeley's edible education class, where he shared the stage with three Chez chefs and helped cook a delicious tomato sauce for 600 attendees. So Harold, thank you so much for joining us. We're really happy you are here. Well, thanks for the invitation. It's fun. Great. And we're also joined by Stacy Slate to my right, uh, our community manager at the Edible Schoolyard Project, and Nick Lee, Kitchen AmeriCorps teacher at the Edible Schoolyard Berkeley. Hi, Nick. Hi, Stacy. Thanks for joining us. So, Harold, um, I, I'd love to um, jump in and just start, start by asking the first question, if that's okay. Sure. And it's actually about um, your Edible Education Lecture. Um, in the lecture, there was a lot of talk about simple cooking using traditional methods. For instance, I mentioned um, cooking tomato sauce in a big pot over heat with onions and salt and garlic, so traditional cooking methods. Can you talk a little bit about the basic kitchen science that every cook should know? Well, I would say that um, it's not essential for any cook to know any kitchen science uh, because people have been cooking for thousands of years and making delicious things um, without necessarily knowing what's going on. They kind of know from experience um, whether things work or not, whether something's delicious or not. They can kind of make mid-course corrections by adding a little bit of this or that. But I would say that the the more that you do know about what's going on, uh, the better you can do it, uh, and the more interesting it is. I mean, it's because there's some amazing stuff happening in that pot, and uh, it's just a, a, a way to connect with what's going on in there and with the generations of cooks who have managed to figure out what's going on. So I would um, maybe focus on two particular things as sort of basic kitchen science for a uh, cook who's interested in getting into it. One has to do with flavor, and it's simply the, the realization that the flavor of food comes essentially from uh, taste sensations on the tongue, uh, sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and savory, uh, or what's sometimes called umami, uh, and then the aromas that come with the food that we sense in our nose. Uh, and they're countless. We have only a few basic tastes, but we can smell many, many different uh, aroma notes. And if you, if you understand that, then when you're making something and you're tasting it, and there seems to be something missing, that helps you hone in on what you might do in order to adjust things and, and make it better. And I like to think of taste and smell as sort of being the the foundation and then the, the structure of the building of, uh, of the flavor of the food. So the tastes really give you the, 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 the roots or the foundation for w whatever is happening in the variable sorts of aroma. And often what's missing is uh, some sweetness or some saltiness or some acidity. Just to give a little bit more oomph to uh, uh, to the flavor as a whole. And it's amazing how much the aroma of a, of a food can be amplified, not by adding more ingredients of, um, you know, the tomatoes or the onions, for example, but by adding uh, just the right amount of salt or just the right amount of, say, lemon juice or vinegar or something like that to get the flavor to be more lively on the tongue, and then it becomes more lively in general. So that's one thing, is just kind of knowing the general anatomy of, uh, of flavor. The other thing that's really good to know is sort of uh, the importance of temperature in dealing with foods. Um, uh, cooking is essentially uh, ingredients plus heat. <laughs> and 
it turns out that the amount of heat that you add, just like the amount of ingredients you add, is really critical to the result. Mm -hmm. Especially if you're cooking uh, things that are really heat sensitive, and those are protein foods, so like um, meats, fish, and eggs in particular. Um, if you realize that they are really sensitive to heat and that uh, if you cook them above about 140 degrees Fahrenheit, they're going to be dry, then that will automatically save you lots and lots of failures uh, because you know that there's this kind of upper limit that you need to be careful about. Mm -hmm. uh, and then down at the, at the other extreme, in, in preserving foods by way of uh, cooling them down, in refrigeration and freezing and so on, it's really good to know that down there a few degrees can make a huge difference too. So for example, fish, which is really sensitive to spoilage, will last days longer uh, in good quality, in good condition, if you put it on ice in the refrigerator so that it's not actually frozen, but it's as cold as it can be compared to just leaving it in the refrigerator at your ambient refrigerator temperature, which is going to be more like, I don't know, 45 or something like that. If you drop the temperature of the fish down to 33 or 34, it'll last uh, in good condition for much, much, much longer. So just knowing that those things are going on, that means that uh, you can, if, if you have some kind of problem or um, you, you want to know how to do something as uh, and have as much insurance as possible that it's going to turn out well, then you can go and dig around on the web or in a book or something like that and find out what those critical temperatures are or how best to handle things and, um, and do a better job. Good tips. I'm wondering if the refrigeration companies are going to want to create fish drawers or something like that in which <laughs> they're lined with ice or I can imagine some sort of idea coming from that. No, no, that's a, that's a great idea. I mean, they do have vegetable uh, Veg yeah. and the, the thing is that you know, every refrigerator is different, uh, not just the refrigerator itself, but the foods that you keep in it, where, the, where you put them, how full it is, how many times you open the door. I mean, there's so many variables. So what I'd like to recommend is uh, that people have a, um, a non-contact thermometer. It, it looks like a little, like a gun, and mm -hmm. you point it at what you want to take the temperature of, and you pull the trigger, and it tells you instantaneously what the temperature of that surface is. And you can use that uh, not only to check the temperature, say, of a frying pan, and know when it's time to add the oil and start cooking, but you can use it to check the different spots in your refrigerator. Uh, and and find out where it is. If you've got fish and you don't happen to have ice, you know what the coldest spot in your fridge is, having done that kind of survey. And in mine, I know that it's uh, it's the um, vegetable drawers at the very bottom. I have a, a freezer uh, underneath the, the main refrigerator compartment, so it's really cold down there. And at the interface between the freezer and the fridge, that's where it's coldest. Huh. So that's where I keep meat, fish, things like that that are especially sensitive. Very interesting. Hey, good to know. Good tips. I think, Nick, you should get one for the Edible Schoolyard Kitchen. You know, I actually already have one my, <laughs> at home. So I'll, I'll just bring it in and we can test out our fridge. <laughs> Very cool. Awesome. Great. Well, Stacy, yeah. I don't know if you want to jump in. Well, I'm sort of two things that you've mentioned are an interesting way to think about food trends happening these days or experimental cooking. So the first part of what you were talking about with traditional cooking has a lot to do with sort of an awareness of, as you said, the I think the anatomy of taste and being aware of all the senses. And then the second part of sort of precision cooking, understanding temperature and heating and cooling. So I'm wondering, you know, Emily mentioned the idea of using fire or traditional method to cook food, but where do you place, um, I guess we might call it a trend or a, an experimental technique like molecular gastronomy? Um, how does that um, technique compare to a traditional method? Is it something that you would call experimental? And um, 
if it is experimental, is it something that an everyday cook could use, or do you see it more as a professional um, technique? Uh -huh. Well, um, uh, molecular gastronomy, uh, I feel, is a really unfortunate <laughs> term because um, no cook, no matter how uh, well versed they are in, in modern techniques and the chemistry of cooking and so on, no cook is really thinking about molecules. They're always thinking about ingredients and textures and flavors and you know macroscopic things, not not molecular things. I'm afraid I had a, a, a slight uh, share of the rise of that term, <laughs> uh, uh, which I now deeply regret. <laughs> Partly also because it's just so unappetizing. You know, it doesn't it doesn't sound tasty, whatever <laughs> whatever it is you're talking about. So I prefer to use the term that you use, actually, uh, experimental cooking, uh, and it's it's uh, a way of approaching cooking that has come about in the last ten or fifteen years, and really did come out of professional kitchens, and it came out of a desire, above all, to be innovative. To be creative, not to repeat the the traditional dishes of the past, but to say, okay, we're living in uh, a different era now. It's a, a global world. The world is flat. We can get ingredients from everywhere. We know about interesting techniques from all over the world. So now the question is, um, uh, I don't necessarily want to be a French chef or a Spanish chef or an Italian chef. I want to be a 21st century chef. And uh, what can I do with what the world knows about these ingredients and techniques to do something new and interesting? That's a very specific uh, goal, a very specific motivation, which I think is not really operative in most home kitchens. <laughs> most of us just want to get a tasty dish on the table in an hour or less. Uh, and innovation is not, not, such a, uh, not such a motivator. So most of what uh, goes by uh, the name of experimental cooking or molecular gastronomy, I think is not of such great interest to, uh, to the rest of us. Uh, and often not of such great interest to us even if we're going to a restaurant because sometimes you really want a traditional Italian meal or a traditional French meal or more Japanese or Chinese. Uh, but sometimes it, it's almost like you know going to the theater uh, to see a new play or something like that. You want to find out what's on the mind of this really talented particular individual. Uh, the, the one thing that I, I do think transfers from this molecular gastronomy or exper experimental cooking approach is uh, the idea of curiosity and wanting to know as much as possible about ingredients and how they behave. Um, and uh, precision cooking, which you also mentioned, is a big part of that. So uh, it, it's really this um, generation of chefs that have um, put uh, so-called sous vide cooking on the map. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I think it's a kind of unfortunate term. First of all, it's French, and second, it's uh, it means under vacuum, which I think really uh, is a distraction from the usefulness of the technique, which is to cook things at very precise temperatures um, and at the temperature that you want them to end up at, so that you can't overcook them. It's a it's a wonderful kind of fail-safe way of uh, cooking food that was pioneered in experimental kitchens uh, and I think is really useful for home cooks even if you don't have a, uh, the, the fancy equipment that makes it really easy. Uh, if you know that it's a possibility then for example you can, you can uh, do precision cooking just with a big stock pot of water and a thermometer. Uh, water has a lot of thermal mass so it tends to hold its temperature pretty well and so you put something cold into it to cook it, the temperature doesn't drop that far and if you monitor it every 10 minutes or so and top it up with hot water as needed, you're doing as good a job of, experiment, of uh, precision cooking as uh, someone with a, a thousand dollar immersion circulator. Mm -hmm. 
Harold, can I ask you a personal question? Sure. <laughs> are you are you a precision cooker? Do you only cook for precision, or will you just throw a salad together and eat it? Um, uh, it, it, it? One of the great things about cooking is that um, most of us do at least a little bit of it every day. So I do all kinds of cooking all the time, depending on the circumstances. If I'm trying to understand something in order to write about it, then I do it in a very controlled and systematic way with you know, experiment and control and uh, keep notes and lab notebook and you know, the, whole, the whole deal. Um, if somebody's coming over or my kids are coming back for the holidays or something like that and I just want to get something really nice on the table, then I don't care about any of that stuff. I, but I, I, I take advantage of what I've learned from that way of cooking and try to apply it in a more uh, informal and relaxed way. Yeah, that's a really interesting thought or concept is that if you do have that, or if you're lucky enough to really have that training or to have the time to really learn about experimental cooking and quote unquote precision cooking, that you can bring it back down to that more casual style of cooking and really impress your family and friends. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I need to maybe need to work on that a little bit more myself. Um, Do you think that there is, say, say for, you know, an everyday cook that also has, you know, the desire to be experimental in the kitchen, are there certain cooking tools or devices that you think are particularly approachable? Yeah, I, uh, in fact, my kitchen is a pretty ordinary kitchen. It's my laboratory as well, uh, but I, I don't, I, what I try to do is work with um, instruments, uh, if you like, that uh, anyone else would be able to and that are already pretty traditional uh, things to have in the kitchen. So I have a really good collection of different kinds of thermometers because different kinds of thermometers are um, better or worse for particular kinds of measurements. The, the uh, non-contact thermometer that I mentioned before is great for measuring surface temperatures, but it doesn't tell you anything about the temperature inside a roast, for example. Um, so I have a, a set of thermometers that I think uh, kind of covers the bases and lets me monitor what's going on and have a better sense for um, uh, the the process of heating and cooling and so on. Uh, I have a scale because it, I think it really is useful to be able to weigh things exactly. It's much easier to get reproducible results, especially in baking, which is pretty sensitive to, uh, particularly to moisture contents of doughs and batters and things like that. Um, and um, that's kind of it. You know, I, I do have a couple of other things, uh, but with those two things, with a scale and, uh, and thermometers, a good set of thermometers, I think you can, you can really go a long way to uh, understanding and controlling what you're doing uh, much better. Mm -hmm. Great. Good to know. Wonderful. Nick, I don't know, if it, would you like to ask your question? It's a really interesting one. It kind of jumps over to the teaching side of things. Which yeah, absolutely. Um, so, at the Edible Schoolyard Kitchen, we have a uh, group of eighth grade science classes coming in in a couple weeks, and we're working on a lesson where they're going to be learning about pH, and they're going to be using cabbage juice as an indicator and testing a couple different kitchen ingredients and finding out the pH. And as always in kitchen class, we also cook something. And this week, we're going, or in one of those lessons, we're going to be doing a ricotta cheese, just boiling milk and adding either some lemon juice or some vinegar to curdle that. And even after reading your book, I am struggling to find a way to explain the process of curdling and the chemistry of what's happening in language accessible to eighth grade science students. And I'm wondering if you could help me with that. <laughs> well, that's, that's a challenge. Uh, and, uh, but I think it's, it's wonderful that, uh, that you're undertaking it. And I, it really does seem to me that food is such a wonderful avenue for kids to learn about science because it's something that they care about. You know, there, there's motivation there that, that there isn't for a lot of other things. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, now I, I don't teach 
uh, at that level. I, I'm usually teaching uh, uh, chefs or uh, chefs in training. Uh, so I'm uh, you take what I say with a grain of salt, but I guess what I would start with is um, is just talking about milk and about the the fact that you know this is a it's a liquid. Uh, it's made by animals, all mammals, to nourish their young in their very first days of life. So they have all the things that the uh, that the young animal needs in order to survive and grow. But we look at it and it looks kind of blank. You know, it's just this uh, blank slate of uh, uh, impenetrable. You know, you can't see into it. It's cloudy. You, you don't really know what's going on. So. What is this stuff, and uh, and how do you go from something that's liquid, a liquid food, how does that get turned into the solid body of a mammal? Uh, so there's something in there that is somehow uh, that that the um, that the that living things can turn into structure, even though the liquid itself is structureless. And one of the ways we can probe that and learn something about it is by doing things to the milk to kind of tease out the, the structure building stuff that's inside it that we know has to be in there somewhere, but, but you know, we can't see it. And acidity is, is one way of doing that. Uh, so you, you add uh, acid um, even when it's cold. I mean, it, because heat sort of introduces another element, you know, you can curdle milk just with by squeezing lemon juice into into cold milk, and so you could do that and say, you know, here's we're we're just adding something very simple, and boom, all this stuff drops out. You know, that's that's really interesting. Now, how have people uh, put that to use historically? You milk, you just um, let it sit. Uh, you, you milk cows, and uh, you have lots and lots more than you can drink, and so you just let it sit. It spoils. So how can you turn this this uh, liquid, which has structure building stuff into it, into something that you can hang on to and, and enjoy in a couple of days or a couple of weeks or a couple of months when the, the cows are no longer giving milk? And then you can introduce the idea of cheese and uh, other ways of getting those structure building materials out and concentrating them, getting rid of all the ad additional moisture uh, mm -hmm. so that molds and bacteria can't grow as easily, and then control which molds and bacteria do grow. Um, and then you can bring heat in. Uh, I'm, I'm now thinking about, of course, aged cheeses. You're talking about ricotta, and that's a, a different story, but you could then introduce heat as a way of Making that um, uh, separation of liquid and structure uh, more efficient, you get more of the solid stuff out by heating things up, and then you could talk about proteins and meat, and uh, meat being muscles, and muscles are built out of the structure building stuff in in milk. That's that's how I would kind of try to frame the, the whole thing, just to bring it as close as possible to, to their own experience. Does that make any sense? Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Sure. Are you using a, a visual aid during that class, Nick? You know, we, we are going to be. We're going to be working on that soon. Yeah. Interesting. Because that, I think, you know, with, with everything that we're talking about, and I'm thinking about it also in terms of molecular gastronomy or the experimental cooking, there's also this element of you know, the visual intrigue and the visual understanding of what's actually happening when you're adding science to this equation. That's yeah. often very complex. <laughs> yeah. And that's enough for the, the I mean, pH lab using cabbage juice as an indicator is so fun that they get to see these ingredients changing color, um, representing the acidity or alkalinity of the ingredients. Um, so. Really cool, Harold. You said that um, that you primarily teach chefs and chefs in training, and obviously Nick here is teaching eighth graders and middle schoolers um, science in the kitchen. Essentially, do you? That must excite you to hear that young people are learning 
science in the kitchen and, and experimental cooking and that kind of thing. Do you, are you happy with seeing that? Do you want to see more of that? Um, have you ever talked to anybody seriously about any kind of um, kitchen science programming in schools or what are your thoughts on that? Just out of curiosity. Well, I, I think it's, it's wonderful. Um, not so much from the point of view of um, what I do as from the point of view of the, the kids. Because, uh, and, and in fact, this has happened to me many times over the years. Uh, uh, I'll be talking with people, I'll give a public lecture or something like that. People will come up to ask questions. And so many times people have come up and said, you know, when I was in school, I hated science. I hated chemistry. But if I knew that this is what science is, this is what chemistry could be, then my life would have been different. And so the, the chance to... Uh, to make a difference in the way kids think about science, not as something, not as this kind of body of really uh, complicated, difficult to understand uh, concepts and, you know, a language that you don't speak and, um, and, you know, math, really difficult math and things like that. If you realize that um, uh, essentially all science is, is curiosity and persistence, you know, you taking that curiosity and doing something with it, rather than just being curious and then shrugging your shoulders and, and going on. Um, and then it seems to me that you open uh, the eyes of these, these little human beings in the making uh, to the wonders of the world around them in all kinds of ways. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> I have a, a question for you, sort of talking about your own curiosities. Um, in cooking. And since the kitchen seems to be or is your, your laboratory, um, what are the most curious kitchen puzzles, as you, you've sort of talked about, um, that you've either uncovered and that's been extremely rewarding or that still completely mystify you? <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I've been doing it for a few decades, so there, there are lots of them. Uh, I, I thought I would just mention two. One, because we were just talking about cabbage juice and as a pH indicator, so uh, the, the pigments in vegetables are sensitive to acidity, and that's why you can make litmus paper and cabbage juice uh, uh, indicators and things like that. Uh, and one of the general rules for those anthocyanin pigments is that when you add acid, they generally turn pink. And when you add uh, something alkaline, they turn bluish. Uh, so I was just in Japan uh, a month ago, and a friend of mine was in Japan two months ago. And he told me when he got back, he, he called me up, he's also very interested in the science of, uh, of cooking. He said, you know, I was served the craziest eggplant over there. It was, you know, delicious little slices of eggplant with the skin on, but the skin was bright blue. And I thought, oh man, this is going to be, it's going to taste like baking soda, because that's the only way you can get that color in a, in a vegetable. But it, it wasn't, it was acidic. So you explain to me, Mr. Food Science Guy, how do you get uh, an acidic, uh, purplish vegetable to come out blue instead of reddish. And I said, ah, oh, sounds interesting, I'll, I'll work on that. And then I went over to Japan myself, saw some of these prepared eggplants in a supermarket, and read the ingredients list. And the ingredients list, I was thinking, you know, there might be something interesting there. It was essentially just uh, eggplant, vinegar, and salt. <laughs> that was it. Uh, so that's an example of uh, a puzzle that is still bothering me. I still <laughs> how that happens. Um, and I haven't gotten, because this is just a month or so ago, I haven't gotten around to bringing in a shipment of eggplants and then doing different things to see if I can figure it out. But that's really nagging me right now. Uh, as far as things that have been really fun to figure out, I have to say that the the, the puzzle that really I enjoyed solving the most doesn't have so much to do with cooking. It has more to do with the mess that you make when you cook. So uh, I was, you know, cooking for years. I wear glasses, eyeglasses, and I noticed 
that after I fry things on the stovetop, I often end up with spatter on my eyeglasses, uh, and you know, there's spatter all over the place. Um, but then I noticed one day that all the spatter was on the inside surface of my glasses and not the outside. And that really bothered me. You know, how could that possibly be? The, the, the frying pan is in front of me. The oil is kind of coming up like this. And somehow it kind of ducks around the backs of my glasses and gets onto the inside. I, I just couldn't imagine how that was going on. And it, I came up with all kinds of theories that had to do with um, uh, you know, maybe the, I, I did know that the uh, oil droplets, when they're, when they explode like that on the pan, often end up electrically charged. And so I thought maybe there was some kind of electrical charge difference on the inside and outside of my glasses that was causing them to, you know, migrate uh, to one and not the other. Came up with all kinds of crazy theories. None of them seemed to pan out, and so I, I finally did an experiment where I took all the pairs of sunglasses, eyeglasses uh, that I had and set them up around a pan at different angles and at different locations and so on, and then kind of pooled the data from all that and discovered uh, that what's actually going on is most of the oil droplets that you make when you fry don't come at you like this. They go straight up into the air. And when they go straight up into the air, they rise a certain distance and then they start to trickle down again like this. And you're standing there at the stovetop and you're looking down. And so the surface of your glasses that are exposed to that rain of oil is in there. Interesting. So that was one of those eureka moments that also made it was kind of, kind of a yuck moment as well because then you think, all that stuff's going on my head and my shoulders and everything else. So, baseball cap. Yes. <laughs> which, this was the, before the era when every cook wore a baseball cap. Uh, uh, but a baseball cap is, is the best protection for people who wear glasses mm -hmm. when they're frying. That is really funny. I'm just envisioning around your stove all the sunglasses <laughs> and glasses. That just sounds hilarious. That's so funny. Yeah. Wow. That is great. Well, Harold, I mean, we're at the end of our hangout. I don't know if there's anything else you'd like to share. We're just, we're having so much fun. I wish we could keep you on all day. <laughs> but we really appreciate you being here, and I've learned so much, yeah. and um, really hope you'll join us again. Nick, I don't know if you have anything else to share, or any, question, any further questions? I just want to say thank you for helping me with that question, and yeah, that's cool. all. Yeah, I think, Nick, you should show your students uh, a replay of this video so that they will really pay attention and listen. You've got the authority on, on kitchen science talking about cheese. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> well, Harold, thank you so much again. And Nick and Stacy, thanks for joining. Yeah. And for anybody watching, you can find this Hangout and Harold's Edible Education Lecture on our YouTube page at youtube.com slash project and on our website, edibleschoolyard.org, in the resource section. So thanks again, everybody. Thank you, I should Harold. say happy holidays. We're in the mm -hmm. holiday season, and um, hope to see everybody again soon. Good. Thanks Thank very you. much. Thanks. Bye. Bye.